Good evening and welcome to the Immune Deficiency Foundation's first webinar of 2023. Today's program will explore the use of prophylactic antibiotics and antibody deficiencies with Dr. Mark Ballow. My name is Emma Mertens and I'm the Program Manager of Community Health at IDF. On behalf of the Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. For over 40 years, IDF has served as a trusted organization in the PI community by providing accurate and timely information, resources, and support for those living with PI. IDF is dedicated to fostering a community empowered by education. We want you to remember that IDF is committed to our community, serving you as a trusted resource through the use of technology and innovation. We are here to give you the tools and information to become empowered and offer you our compassion, understanding, and support to emphasize that you are not alone on your PI journey. Before we begin, I would like to point out a few housekeeping items to keep in mind for today's webinar. This evening, we are using the Zoom webinar feature. Attendees should be able to see the slides and our presenter and be able to hear myself and our presenter <laughs> speak. Attendees will not be able to activate their video camera or their microphone. There will be the opportunity for questions after the presentation. You are welcome to submit any questions you have for our presenter as you think of them throughout the session. Please type them in the Q&A box in the control panel on your screen. Please do not include any personal health information as all questions will be anonymous and read aloud. A brief disclaimer. Please remember the information presented during this meeting is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We are here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during an educational event. <clears throat> To learn about IDF and explore our resources, please visit our website at www.primaryimmune.org. The website offers a wide variety of online and principal resources for anyone seeking information or support for PI, including our patient and family handbook for primary immunodeficiency diseases. We can also help you find an immunologist or PI specialist in your area with the clinician finder. IDF also offers monthly programming and events. We host monthly lunch and learns and bi-monthly webinars covering various topics facing the PI community. And we also have Get Connected groups, peer support, Ask IDF, and our annual PI conference. Connect with others in the PI community at our 2023 Walk for PI. With events in eight cities across the US and a virtual coast-to-coast -coast walk, anyone can participate. Did you know that 24 IDF research grants have been funded solely by our Walk for PI? Visit walkforpi.org to get in on the fun and make a difference in the PI community. This meeting is made possible by our wonderful sponsors. It is due to their partnerships and contributions that we can provide programs like this for the PI community. Please join me in thanking our 2023 sponsors. CSL Bearing, Griffles, Takeda, Horizon Therapeutics, Acredo, Octopharma, Farming Healthcare, AstraZeneca, Bioproducts Laboratory, Kedrion Biopharma, Enzivant, X4 Pharmaceuticals, and Chiesi Global Rare Diseases. And now I am so pleased to introduce our presenter for this evening. Dr. Mark Ballow is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of South Florida. He also serves as the Consulting Medical Director for IDF. Welcome, Dr. Ballow. So I'm going to talk about prophylactic antibiotics uh, that we often use in patients with uh, primary immune deficiency disease. Oh, not changing, okay. So the question is, should prophylactic antibiotics be used in primary antibody immune deficiency, which is the most frequent of all the immune deficiencies? So, uh, <clears throat> in most surveys, it's clearly over 50% of the primary um, immune deficiencies. So what, what do we know? Currently, antibiotic prophylaxis is guided by the common pathogens we see in, in the specific uh, immune deficiency. So, for example, 
in antibody deficiencies where encapsulated bacteria are the major pathogens, obviously we want uh, antibiotics that are going to address uh, those potential pathogens. If the primary pathogen is Staphylococcus because of uh, skin infections, uh, then you know we want to target then to that pathogen uh, specifically. Most of the information we have today on prophylactic antibiotics for PI is actually experience gained from other chronic illnesses, uh, particularly cystic fibrosis, but also uh, HIV and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and, and others as well. So <clears throat> let me, I can't cover all the immune deficiencies. I'm just gonna highlight uh, a few of them. Uh, so let me talk about the neutrophil defects and the one that's probably uh, the most common is chronic granulomatous disease. And uh, the, the typical bacteria that are involved are uh, staph, uh, associated with infection of the, the lymph nodes and other, other tissues as well. In more advanced disease, uh, there are uh, fungal species such as Nocardia and Aspergillus, uh, but there's also some gram negatives that may be involved such as uh, Serratia, uh, and uh, Burkholder sebaceous is also another organism. So the first line prophylactic antibiotic that we use for chronic granulomatous disease is trimethopter and sulfamethoxazole, uh, otherwise known as Bactrim or Zeptra. And as you know, there's two different types of uh, chronic granulomatous disease, autosomal uh, autosomal recessive as well as X-linked. X and you can see that uh, if you use this type of prophylactic antibiotic, it decreases the incidence of non-fungal infections, that is mainly bacterial infections from 7.1 to 2.4 per 100 patient months. And in the X-linked uh, chronic granulomatous disease, which is actually a, perhaps a little bit uh, I mean, more frequent infections uh, reduces it from 15.8 to 6.9 infections per 100 patient months. Uh, obviously, uh, this particular uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is not really directed at the fungal infections, so there's no change in fungal infections. So we often use uh, other antibiotics for fungal prophylaxis. Uh, a common one is citraconazole, but more frequently, voriconazole and aposiconazole uh, is being used to prevent invasive fungal infections. Uh, and you can see some of the toxicities associated with them. So it just depends on the uh, center, you know, which uh, antifungal prophylaxis is being used. So for example, at NIH, they use uh, a lot of voriconazole and aposiconazole in, in there. Uh, patient population. Of course, they see more uh, far advanced uh, patients with more significant disease as well. And then a third prophylactic, I won't call it an antibiotic because it's not an antibiotic, it's actually a cytokine, is interferon gamma. And th this has been reported in by in vitro findings to stimulate the oxidative burst which is a good thing because that's one of the things that's lacking in patients with chronic granulomatous disease. And it does help about two thirds of the patients with chronic granulomatous disease, regardless of the uh, genetic defect by enhancing bacterial cytoactivity. So I know this is one of the things that we use in our patient population interferon uh, uh, gamma. What about T-cell immune deficiencies? And here we're talking about severe combined immune deficiency. This is early onset. Uh, these are children born without an immune system, both T-cells and uh, B-cells. So they can't make specific antibodies and they can't, uh, and their T-cells don't work as well. And here we're worried about opportunistic pathogens such as pneumocystis. And again, we use, uh, Bactrim or Septra as a prophylactic uh, agent. There's, there's other uh, antimicrobial uh, 
uh, prophylaxis as well that we can use. We obviously have to use viral and fungal infections since their T cells don't work. So, you know, they have increased susceptibility to certain viruses, particularly DNA viruses like the herpes viruses. And that's why we use acyclovir. And uh, for antifungal infections, uh, fluconazole is, is a, a frequent uh, antifungal uh, product that we use. We obviously avoid live viral vaccines since these patients uh, can't mount a T cell response. So we don't wanna give them a live viral vaccine that may harm them. And uh, we avoid uh, mother's breastfeeding because if the mother is CMV positive, uh, we don't wanna transmit CMV uh, viral infection to the uh, uh, newborn infant. So let's turn our attention to humoral immune deficiencies. As I said, these make up more than 50% of the uh, PI types. And here, as I mentioned before, we're worried about certain bacterial pathogens, particularly those that are encapsulated like streptococcus pneumonia, homosalus influenza. And the use of uh, prophylactic antibiotics varies very widely. So what do we actually know? Uh, about the use of prophylactic antibiotics in patients with primary antibody uh, deficiency. Nada, Nietz, Nita, whatever that is, maybe Russian, Green. Again, we know very little because uh, there hasn't really been any comprehensive studies of prophylactic antibiotics in patients with primary antibody deficiency. So most of the data that we have is based on experience and based on the use of prophylaxis and other chronic diseases, as I mentioned before, uh, particularly uh, cystic fibrosis. So there's the lack of controlled studies. And <clears throat> this is a publication uh, that was published in 2012, where they looked at the use of adjunct prophylactic antibiotics by uh, experts from the European Society of Immune Defi Deficiency, that's ESID, and that's the very black bar. Focused clinical immunologists, that's the, the one that's in between the black and the gray, and the general, the general uh, physician, uh, I might say allergist immunologists, uh, and as well as other uh, uh, type of physicians. And you can see that uh, for the most part, those clinical immunologists that are focused, and certainly those from Europe, uh, you know, uh, frequently use prophylactic antibiotics uh, almost 50% of the, of the time. Uh, and what are the diseases that prophylactic antibiotics are used by these groups of uh, physicians? So for common variable immunodeficiency disease, uh, uh, antibiotic prophylactic antibiotic use is about 50% with all the different groups, uh, no matter what their background or expertise. Uh, in selective antibody deficiency, again, it's about 50% across all groups. And with patients with agamic globulin anemia, again, it's... Uh, uh, with all, all groups, maybe a little bit a little bit more uh, with the uh, allergist immunologist. So that's the experience. So what are the regimens uh, are shown here uh, for not immune deficiency, but other diseases uh, that have that are associated with recurrent infections, such as recurrent acute otitis media. That's what AOM stands for, and uh, the two that are uh, frequently used is amoxicillin and sulfasoxazole. For chronic sinusitis, it's erythromycin and azithromycin, roxythromycin, which is similar to azithromycin. Uh, CF bronch uh, bronchiectasis is azithromycin, and this is where we have gained most of our experience because of uh, controlled studies in patients with cystic fibrosis. In uh, patients who have bronchiectasis that do not have cystic fibrosis, and you can see again, 
azithromycin uh, is frequently uh, frequently used. What about primary antibody deficiency? Well, in uh, X-linked egg hemoglobinemia and common variable immunodeficiency, and here the suggestions is greater than three breakthrough infections or extremely severe infections, uh, despite the fact that these patients are on, on aminoglobin replacement therapy, we use uh, azithromycin. Uh, the five milligrams per kilo is for children given three days per week, and that's important, not every day. Um, so it can be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, as an example. Adults, we usually give 250 milligrams uh, for three times a week. Or the other choice is Bactrim or Septra. <clears throat> Again, for our children, it's five milligrams per kilo. Now that's given every day. Uh, at least I give it every day, not three times a week. <clears throat> or adults, we give one double strain tablet uh, daily. For transient uh, hypogammaglobin anemia of infancy and selective IgA deficiency, it's, it's really very similar. Uh, it's, it's, in fact, it's the same, no difference there. So let's take a look at selective antibody deficiency. And I, I know there's a lot of controversy on using immunoglobin replacement therapy in patients with selective antibody deficiency. What is, what is SA, SAD? Uh, these are individuals who have, actually have normal serum immunoglobulins. They have normal levels of GM and A, but they don't make specific antibodies very well to pneumococcal uh, vaccines, particularly the unconjugated vaccine like Pneumovax. So this is a particular study that was uh, done. It was a prospective crossover study in the Netherlands of 64 patients. And they found that the overall efficacy of the two regimens, that is immunoglobin replacement therapy and prophylactic antibiotics did not differ. Uh, a smaller proportion of patients uh, suffered uh, adverse events using prophylactic antibiotics, 26% versus those that were on immunoglobin replacement therapy, 60%. Uh, so, but they did say that patients who had persistent infections while using prophylactic antibiotics suffered fewer infections after switching to immunoglobulin replacement therapy. So this is kind of my approach in patients with selective antibody deficiency. I will first use prophylactic antibiotics. And if they fail prophylactic antibiotics, then I will give them a trial of aminoglobin replacement therapy. Um, and this study certainly supports going in that direction. It's furthermore, it's easier to get it approved by uh, the insurers by telling the insurers that the patient failed prophylactic antibiotics. And therefore we have to go to the next step, which is aminoglobin replacement uh, therapy. Again, which antibiotics is the ones that I mentioned in the previous uh, uh, table. Uh, by the way, I do not use amoxicillin because I found that it does not use, it does not do very well in preventing infections. And I do not use augmentin because I reserve augmentin for if a patient has breakthrough infection, then I'll use uh, uh, augmentin. So I do not use amox and I do not use augmentin. So the conclusion of this study is that Prophylactic antibiotics and immunoglobin replacement therapy is comparable, uh, but there are those patients who have persistent infection despite prophylactic antibiotics that need to uh, have a trial of immunoglobin replace, replacement therapy. So this is actually a recent article that was published in 2019 in our journal, the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Uh, remember I told you there was actually no uh, controlled studies of prophylactic antibiotics in patients with primary antibody deficiency. Well, this is, in fact, uh, one that was uh, published recently. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial of low-dose azithromycin, exactly what I 
I mentioned in the table in the previous slide. And uh, the patients were screened for eligibility. They were randomized. So jumpy slides. Let me go back. So they took 250 milligrams of the Zithro uh, three consecutive days, which a member, as I said, it's only three days, either Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or it could be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or uh, placebo. And they followed these patients for two years and they looked at uh, 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 reduced respiratory exacerbations in patients with primary antibody deficiency who had chronic infection-related uh, pulmonary disease. And uh, you could see that uh, the primary outcome was a decreased risk of exacerbations. And uh, you, know, the, you could see the reduction between the red line and the blue line was uh, significant. There was also improvement in health-related quality of life, uh, pulmonary function testing, uh, et cetera. And the secondary outcomes was also seen lower risk of hospitalization, lower need for additional antibiotic courses. There was no higher rate of uh, macrolide resistance, which is important because I'm going to talk about that in a minute. No drug related toxicity, improved quality of life. Uh, um, and some patients, some patients did have improvement FEV1, others did not. And there was a reduced count in the blood uh, neutrophils, which is also a good sign of reduction in inflammation. We now have enough experience, and we now have that placebo control study with azithromycin uh, that was uh, very uh, suggestive that indeed azithromycin prophylaxis as used in patients with cystic fibrosis is helpful. What about some other PIs, just briefly, hyper-IgM uh, hyper deficiency? Very similar to XLA and common variable immunodeficiency, but they do have a partial T cell defect. So those patients are uh, placed on prophylaxis uh, with Bactrim or Septra for uh, pneumocystis uh, prophylaxis. So just a word about drug resistance, because that's always a concern when we put patients on uh, prophylactic antibiotics. So um, you can see that uh, this is a, not, not a, it's not emerging. It's, it's really has been talked about recently. As a matter of fact, uh, some resistant strains, I think it was salmonella, if I'm, if I'm right, uh, to uh, current, current, currently used antibiotics. So uh, this is deaths from drug-resistant infection. And you can see it, it's even higher than uh, cancer, diabetes, and other uh, causes, as you can see here. And, you know, those of, you know, we use a lot of prophylactic antibiotics in the United States, uh, not as much as Spain or France, but certainly uh, it's up, up there, as you can see on this, uh, on this curve. And this uh, shows us penicillin resistance, streptococcus uh, pneumonia, you know, a frequent infection in patients with primary antibody deficiency. So this is from the free a recent uh, CDC report on 2019 on antibiotic resistance uh, threats. And you can see the urgent threats. I'm not going to read through this. Uh, serious threats, concerning threats, and, uh, and the watch list uh, shown on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, you can download this yourself, the, the download information is at the bottom, cdc.gov, drug resistance slash biggest threats. So the key concepts in use of prophylactic antibiotics in patients with primary immune deficiency is uh, patients with chronic granulomas disease benefit from prophylactic antibiotics, antifungals, and possibly interferon gamma. There are no published controlled studies. Yes, there is. There's now one controlled study recently published on azithromycin in patients with primary antibody deficiency. So I have to change that slide. Microbial antibiotic resistance is a significant problem for long-term use of prophylactic antibiotics. Um, 
particularly uh, macrolides as, as well as Bactrim and Septra. So what I do is I actually take the patient off prophylaxis during the summer to allow their bacterial flora to recover back to what it is uh, in that individual at baseline. So I pull them off probably uh, sometime in May or at the end of May, and then you know uh, consider when I see them back in the fall, uh, restarting prophylaxis uh, at, at that time. Although it may be a common practice to rotate or periodically change prophylactic antibiotics, again, uh, there is no studies to uh, support this uh, particular uh, uh, practice of rotating uh, antibiotics. So we do not use it. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell, for that wonderful presentation. Um, let me see. Again, my name is Emma Mertens. I'm the program manager of community health at IDF. And as you all know, joining us through the Q&A, we have Dr. Mark Ballow. A friendly reminder that if you would like to ask anything during the Q&A to please enter your questions in the box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, all right, so it's 727, so we have about a full hour, so we should be able to get through everyone's questions, which is great. All right, so the first question I'm going to start with is, this individual asks, for someone with an Im immunoglobulin deficiency, when would and should prophylactic antibiotics be used? Uh, where are you, Emma? Because I'm looking at the Q&A list. Um, I'm reading from the, from the Q, I'll read you the Q&A questions. I'm reading them from the um, panel at the bottom of the screen. I was just going to oh. go from the from the um, from the first. I was going to go in chronological order. Yeah, because the first one I see is prophylactic antibiotics a good idea prior to surgery. Okay, we can start with that one. That's fine. That's that's the one I see. Okay. So again, there's there's no studies. Uh, uh, so it depends on. I think it depends on the surgeon. So for certain. Uh, surgical procedures, uh, clearly there's prophylaxis. So, so for example, example, for knee replacements or other joint replacements, uh, I, you know, they do use prophylactic antibiotics. And uh, so I, I think I would go with the recommendation of the surgeon. Now, this is assuming that, it, that you know, patients are on, immuno, are on adequate doses of immunoglobulin therapy and we try to tell the patient if they're if they're not on sub Q, because remember with sub Q, you get a steady state serum IgG level. If they're on IVIG, to try to time the um, infusion of the uh, IVIG as close to the surgery as possible, so so they're not near a trough level. So the other thing that uh, <clears throat> that may be of interest is with regard to prophylactic prophylactic antibiotics prior to the surgery. For regular dental procedures, you do not have to have prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, but if it's more extensive, perhaps like a, you know, like a root canal uh, or some other surgical procedure, you know, if you have gingivitis and there's inflammation of the gum and they're going to do a lot of surgery around the gum, yes, then I certainly would suggest uh, prophylactic antibiotics. Um, and um, there I would, I guess I would accept the, the suggestion by the dentist or oral surgeon because they have their uh, prophylactic antibiotic protocol that they usually use. Thank you. All right, the next question will ask, what are your thoughts on taking long-term prophylactic antibiotics for other primary immune deficiencies like complement deficiencies? Yeah, here um, where prophylactic antibiotics are suggested are, of course, the, the late-acting complement components, C5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And these patients are susceptible to Neisseria inf infection. So indeed, yes, uh, you know, the protocol is to give them uh, PenVK or, or similar prophylactic antibiotic. Uh, the PenVK is pretty narrow. Uh, uh, 
choice of prophylactic antibiotics, I don't think it'll cause any issues with regard to resistance with Neisseria. And of course, these patients should be immunized with the conjugated uh, Neisseria uh, meningococcal vaccines. That's important as well. So they have a good antibody response. There are some other complement deficiencies like of C3 on the alternative complement pathway. And yes, if they're having, you know, recurrent infections, then I think, again, like primary antibody deficiency, uh, I think it's appropriate to use uh, antibiotic, uh, prophylactic antibiotics. Thank you. Um, all right, so we will revisit this question next. Um, so this individual asked, um, for someone with immunoglobulin deficiencies, when uh, should prophylactic antibiotics be used? Well, um, obviously we do not use it if the patient is on immunoglobulin replacement therapy and they're doing fine. They may have some breakthrough infections, but that doesn't worry me. I think the most frequent kind of clinical presentation that we use prophylactic antibiotics are patients who have chronic sinusitis. And no matter what we do, uh, you know, again, we, we approach chronic sinusitis in a number of different ways, not only adequate immunoglobulin replacement therapy, but nasal rinses or nasal washes, uh, perhaps topical nasal steroids. Um, and in that, and, you know, I know there's a lot of patients with chronic sinusitis that, uh, you know, have difficulty and we will use prophylactic antibiotics in, in those, uh, individuals. Sometimes we have to send them to ENT to see if they are a candidate for surgery, but I'd like to try to avoid that if, if, uh, if possible. Obviously, if a patient has bronchiectasis, uh, that is, you know, inflammation of the lower airways because of past uh, pneumonias, uh, then obviously we use prophylactic antibiotics there, very similar to cystic fibrosis where there's bronchiectasis or COPD. Thank you so much, Dr. Ballow. All right, next question. Is CVID a humoral immune deficiency? Yes, um, common variable immunodeficiency is mostly a B cell deficiency. Some patients, a small percentage of patients may have a partial T cell abnormality as well, but that's, you know, that's in, in, infrequent. Uh, some of these patients with CVID have what we call immune dysregulation in which they are prone to autoimmune disorders, particularly autoimmune hematologic disorders such as immune cytopenias, that is, you know, low platelet count or low red site, red site or low neutrophil counts, but they can have other autoimmune features uh, as well. Thank you, Dr. Ballow. All right, I see a couple of folks have asked this question, so we'll do this one next. Um, do the prophylactic antibiotics cause GI issues? Uh, no, they don't. Not the ones that we use and the doses that we use. So these are zithromycin, no. Um, and the Bactrim Receptor at that dose, uh, no. Now, a couple of things I didn't mention when I mentioned those prophylactic antibiotics. We always ask if there is a hypersensitivity or allergic reaction of history uh, of that with uh, sulfa drugs. Because uh, obviously we don't want to give back receptors to somebody who's a past history of an allergic reaction. And similarly with azithromycin, even though it's a low dose azithromycin, um, if anyone has a past history of a cardiac arrhythmia, uh, we need to have them cleared by their cardiologist to start them on uh, azithromycin uh, prophylaxis. So those are the two caveats uh, with that. Thank you. All right. This individual asks, does the use of prophylactic antibiotic cause a tolerance to the antibiotic to where it is no longer effective? Yeah, well, that, that study that I presented was a two or three year study where they use, you know, 
zithromycin, 250 milligrams, low dose, uh, three times a week. And they looked for that and they did not find any uh, resistant uh, uh, microbial uh, pathogens. And we don't see that with Bactrim or Septra. Uh, you know, we have patients with chronic granuloma disease on Bactrim or Septra for a long time. They're practically their whole life. And, uh, you know, we don't see that as, as an issue. That's why we try to avoid amoxicillin and augmentin and the cephalosporins, because we want to use those for treatment and not, not for prophylaxis. Thank you. All right, our next question is, uh, first of all, this individual says, thank you for this entering interesting presentation. I'm curious what antibiotics may be effective alternatives for patients who have contraindications to medications in the erythromycin family. Well, again, we have the, the other choice is Bactrim or Septra. Um, you know, if our hand is forced, we may go with a cephalosporin, but again, you know, we rather not use that as prophylaxis uh, and use that as treatment only because of the possibility of resistance. Thank you. All right, next question. This individual asks, if you take a prophylactic antibiotic, does that drug work as well when you get sick and if you dose appropriately, or do you need to change antibiotics and go back to the prophylactic when you feel better? That's a good question. I change. You know, as I said before, I reserve the augmented the cephalosporins as treatment modalities if patients have breakthrough. And they're going to have breakthrough. You know, this is not a cure, uh, but it does reduce the number of infections uh, very nicely, as well as the exacerbations of bronchiectasis as, as well. So no, I don't go to a higher dose of azithro. I, I would rather change the antibiotic and, and go to the one, the other immunoglobulin classes. Wonderful, thank you. All right, our next question. This individual asks, if a patient is on prophylactic antibiotic treatment, do they stay on for years or is it a temporary thing? Well, as I mentioned, I uh, take them off of, over the summer and uh, depending on discussions with the patient called shared decision making. Um, and because I assume they're on immunoglobulin replacement therapy, because here we're talking mostly about primary antibody deficiency patients. Uh, we may wait to see how they do and not put them on prophylaxis right away. Thank you, Dr. Ballo. All right, next question. If somebody already had prophylactic augmentin for two plus years, should they stay on it and hope azithromycin will work for breakthrough? Or would you think we should switch to azithromycin and hope the augmentin will work for a breakthrough? Yeah, I think the latter approach is, uh, is what I would vote for. You know, the summer is coming up, so I probably wouldn't make any changes now. Um, as I said, I would probably, you know, I don't know, you know, the extent of this individual's uh, infections, but if, if I could, I would take them off in the summertime and then, you know, try Zithro in the, in the fall rather than Augmentin. Thank you. All right, this individual asks, is, the same is it the same outcome for SCID patients and combined immunodeficiency patients with antibiotic choices and reasoning? Yeah, pretty much. Um, although, you know, patients with um, com uh, combined immunodeficiency um, are, are different than the patients with severe combined immunodeficiency that pre present at birth or soon after birth, certainly within the first six to nine months of age. So patients with combined immunodeficiency, it just depends on how extensive their T cell deficiency is. And we gauge that by um, certain in vitro testing, such as uh, lymphocyte proliferative responses to mitogens and specific antigens like candida and tetanus, 
So it really depends uh, on the extent of their T cell immune deficiency and the past history of infection. So for example, if indeed they have a past history of infections of herpes virus infections, then yes, then clearly, you know, putting them on acyclovir may benefit that, that, that patient. Uh, pneumocystis uh, prophylaxis, uh, that would probably require a pretty significant T cell defect uh, in order to prophylax for uh, pneumocystis. But again, we have the tools to evaluate that and engage that with each individual patient. Thank you. All right, for an adult with CVID who is on immunoglobulin replacement therapy, how often can you see antibiotics to prevent worsening, or how, sorry, how often can you use antibiotics to prevent worsening of illness after getting a mild viral illness without acquiring resistance? Um, you know, I don't, th I don't think we know the exact answer to that as far as acquiring re resistance. Um, but obviously we, you know, if the patient is, after an infection is developing significant uh, chronic lung disease, then I, you know, I think it's an, important to try to control that uh, by not only adequate doses of amino lung replacement therapy, but prophylactic antibiotics. Um, you know, what about acquiring resistance? As I said before, it's, it's unusual with the low doses of zithro and the, and the backroom doses that we use. Thank you. All right, next question. How do you manage an antibiotic break in young kids who are in school and constantly exposed to infections? Yeah, I assume you're talking about a child who has a primary antibody uh, immune de de deficiency. And as I said before, you know, putting them on prophylactic antibiotic, they're going to break through, uh, particularly those in school, because they're going to, you know, get infected with viral infections. And I, I think it's a judgment call uh, where they break through with a upper respiratory tract infection that appears to be a viral infection, then I would persist with the prophylactic antibiotics and not change to a treatment antibiotic unless the infection seems to progress uh, to a, a real ear infection or a real uh, a sinus infection. I say real because, you know, a lot of times I think uh, many physicians uh, over-diagnose uh, sinusitis. Uh, so uh, that, 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 that's my approach. Again, there's no studies to support uh, either way. Thank you. All right, this individual asks, can you address the use of antibiotics prophylactically for a patient with a cold when they frequently develop pneumonia symptoms following a cold? In particular, I have good syndrome with B and T cell deficiency. Yeah, again, uh, you know, those patients, many patients with good syndrome do have uh, lower airway recurrent infections and therefore, I would keep them on prophylactic antibiotics. And if they break through, then I would change the antibiotic uh, uh, suitably. Uh, and I think it's important if, they're, if the person can bring up sputum is to get culture and sensitivities from the sputum to kind of direct what the, what the antibiotic treatment should be. I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's equally uh, important. So, you know, if an individual finds himself every time they get a URI due to a virus, it seems to progress and, and develop an exacerbation of pneumonia, then I, I think that would be an appropriate use of pro, prophylactic antibiotics. But again, just remember that if they can bring up sputum, it's very important to get culture and sensitivities to identify the organism and sensitivities. Thank you. All right, the next question. Um, this individual wants to know, are there over-the-counter products to replace antibiotics if our doctors won't prescribe them to us? No, the answer is no. 
I'm not sure what they were thinking of, but no. No, antibiotics are prescribed. There's nothing over the counter. All right, next question. Um, I think we touched on this a little bit in one of our earlier questions, but I'll ask it again just in case. Do you use any prophylactic antibiotics for complement deficiencies? I think we answered that one already. Okay. Yes, okay. and the answer is yes, PenVK, but get immunized with meningococcal vaccines. Thank you. Just want to make sure we don't miss any folks. Um, this individual asks, do children with XLA build resistance to antibiotics? I, I have not seen any studies on that, so I, I can't answer that from, uh, from data in the literature. Uh, but it's, it's possible, certainly. You know, there are resistant strains of bacteria out there. And if, you know, if they're on, let's say, augmentin or let's say amoxicillin for a long time, uh, then they can develop strains of bacteria that are resistant to amoxicillin. Thank you. All right. Um, I know we talked about CGD in your presentation a little bit, and this individual wants to know, why is there a better result for AR CGD versus X-linked CGD when using prophylactic antibiotics? Yeah, uh, some of the patients with autosomal recessive CGD have some oxidative function. So uh, in, a, in, in contrast to the patients with X-linked in which they have no oxidative uh, burst or oxidative function. So the fact that some of the autosomal recessives have a little bit, uh, which we can actually determine by uh, in vitro testing, as a matter of fact, uh, they tend to they tend to be, do better and have less infection. Whereas obviously the X-linked that can't mount any respiratory bursts against uh, bacteria, uh, they're the ones that are most at risk for infection. Thank you. Um, all right, next question: How often do you see kidney failure in patients being treated with Bactrim prophylactically? I have never seen that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, uh, but I have not, thank goodness, I've not seen that in any of our patients. Thank you. Um, next question. I know um, earlier we asked a question because a couple of people had been wondering if um, GI issues can be caused from prophylactic antibiotics. And this individual um, just wanted to follow up to that question and ask, do you have any resources on how to mitigate the damage of antibiotics on our GI system? Well, I think most of the conversation here is using probiotics. And um, I think that's a reasonable approach. Um, and I'm not an expert on probiotics, but you know, there are differences and with different pro probiotics, my, some are more useful than others. Um, so that's, uh, I, th I think that's reasonable to use a uh, probiotic. 